going to continue with the discussion of the chittas, the states of consciousness, by going into chapter three, which is called the compendium of miscellaneous topics, and do a section of this, a subsection of this chapter called the compendium of functions. So this section will make clear the functions of the particular cheetahs in the scheme that we went through yesterday. And so this section speaks of 14 functions of the cheetahs. So we have rebirth linking, the life continuum, or I prefer just to use the Pali word bhavanga, inverting, then the five sense modalities, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. Then we have receiving, investigating, determining, the javana, registration, and then the death. And then this is said to be by way of stage, we have 10. And the, the way we get 10 is simply that these five, these five in the cognitive process that we looked at yesterday, these five occupy the same stage. So you could see that here, that in place of eye consciousness, you could put ear, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, or body consciousness. So by way of stages, this position is just one position. So all of those five types of sense consciousness occupy one stage. Okay, now in explaining the functions, I have to sort of clear up a point which otherwise might be a bit confusing. And that is, we give a name to a particular chitta, a convenient name, often in terms of one of its primary functions. But this doesn't mean that that chitta has only one function. But certain chittas can exercise several functions even though that type of chitta is named after one function that's particularly prominent. I use an analogy to illustrate this. We could have a man who is in his um, professional life, he is a medical doctor. So everybody refers to him as Dr. Johnson, but he's also in his home life, he's the husband of his wife. They have a couple of children. So in relation to his, to his children, he's the father. He might be the coach of the town little league baseball team. So in that case, they'll call him Coach Johnson. And yet when people are always addressing him politely, they'll call him Dr. Johnson, Dr. Johnson. But his wife doesn't call him Dr. Johnson. His children don't call him Dr. Johnson and the little league baseball players call him Coach Johnson, or maybe by his first name, Coach Sam. So if we bear that in mind and apply that to the cheetahs, we could see how a cheetah might have a particular name or designation, but be performing several functions different from the one after which it's named. Okay, so now let's look through the explanation of the functions. And this was a point that I made at the beginning of yesterday's session, that the cheetahs occur either within the cognitive process. Those are the functions here from three through 13. And then there are three functions that occur outside the cognitive process. That is rebirth linking, the bhavanga or substratum consciousness and death. Okay, now we'll look at these functions in greater detail. 
Okay, here we have the rebirth linking. So this is the function of the chitta at the very first moment when the mind springs up in the new existence, the very moment that the consciousness springs up in the case of a human birth, it will be, or a human life will be the moment that consciousness arises or that the mind arises in the womb, in the mother's womb. In other realms of existence, the rebirth linking can occur differently. Like in the heavenly realms, I think it just occurs. The being comes into the existence fully formed without a gradual process of embryonic development. But anyway, this chitta is called pati sandhi, which means linking again, because it links the new existence to the previous one. And the pati sandhi chitta, of course, it occurs only once in any individual existence at the very moment of rebirth. And then just for that one instantaneous flash, like boom, consciousness has arisen or the mind process has arisen to start the new life. Okay, after rebirth linking, we have the same type of consciousness taking on a different function. This is the function of bhavanga. And this is, I say, bhavanga is the function of consciousness by which the continuity of the individual is preserved through the duration of any single existence. So after the pati sandhi chitta, the rebirth linking has occurred, it's then followed by the bhavanga chitta, which it's a resultant consciousness of the same type as the pati sandhi chitta, but it performs a different function that is, its function is to preserve the continuity of the individual existence. But though the bhavanga preserves continuity of existence, it doesn't remain just as one chitta continuing for 70 or 80 years, but rather the bhavanga chittas are constantly arising and passing away every moment during life whenever there is no active cognitive process taking place. And as I mentioned yesterday, this type of consciousness, we could see it most clearly in deep dreamless sleep. Of course, we, when we're in deep dreamless sleep, we don't know we're in the bhavanga. But when we wake up, we know that we have been asleep with no dreams. And then we could realize that the bhavanga was occurring during that period, preserving our, the continuity of our personal identity. And then during waking life, the mind is constantly dropping into the bhavanga and emerging out, dropping in, coming out, like thousands of times, maybe within the snap of a finger. And then when a sense object knocks on a sense door, then the bhavanga stops, then an active cognitive process occurs in order to experience the object. Then when that cognitive process is finished, then the bhavanga occurs again until the next cognitive process occurs. And so the bhavanga continues on without remaining static for two consecutive moments. Okay, now we come to the adverting, the function of adverting. So this is when an object impinges either at one of the sense doors or at the mind door. Two possibilities here. So then the bhavanga is disturbed and then the bhavanga is cut off and then when the bhavanga is cut off, then a chitta arises, turning to the object. So that's what's meant by adverting, the act of turning 
to the object. And the cheetah can turn to the object either at one of the five physical sense doors or at the mind door. And so we have actually two kinds of inverting. One is five sense door inverting and the other is mind door inverting. But the two are similar in that it's a cheetah that turns to the object and that is what's meant by adverting. <clears throat> okay, then in positions four to eight, <clears throat> we have the cheetah that directly cognizes the object that has arrived. After the moment of adverting, then a cheetah arises directly knowing, well, I, even the word knowing is not so accurate, directly experiencing that object. And so if the object that's knocking is a visible form, then it will be eye consciousness, if it's a sound, ear consciousness, and so on. And then what's an important clarification is that we speak about these functions as seeing, hearing, and so on. But the eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, as I said yesterday, they're completely stupid in that they don't know anything about what they're seeing, hearing, smelling, and so on. All they do is like the camera sort of flash and take in the object to just momentarily illuminate the object. So they, they're not able to identify on their own. They don't identify the object of sight or the object of hearing. So what I say is that the, these are momentary occasions of consciousness, momentary cheetahs, by which the sense object is experienced in its bare immediacy and simplicity before any kind of identification or processing of the object takes place. Then that bare moment of sense consciousness is followed by a moment, a chitta that performs the function of receiving the object. It's in a way of take, I can't really explain it further, but it's a sort of like the cheetah takes in the object that's appeared. Then there takes place a momentary investigation of it. But this is a pre-conceptual investigation. And then in the case of the sense object at the five sense doors, determines that object. But again, this is occurring at a pre-conceptual level. So this is occurring in regard to the five sense doors. At the mind door is somewhat different. So we have these three moments, receiving, investigating, and determining. So those are three separate functions. And at the mind door, these three functions do not occur. Rather, when the object appears at the mind door, that would be like a purely mental object. There occurs mind door adverting, which we already mentioned, followed immediately, or, or the mind door adverting occurs immediately after the bhavanga is cut off. There are no intermediate functions. Okay, then following either the determining consciousness in the case of a five sense door process or the mind door adverting in the case of a mind door process, there occurs a phase usually consisting of seven cheetahs 
which is called javana. The word javana comes from the verb javati, which means to run. So javana is literally, it's running through, but it's, it doesn't make sense in English. So I just use javana without translation. So the javana consists of phase consists of a series of cheetahs, usually seven, all identical in kind, normally identical in kind, which in a sense, they run swiftly through the object in apprehending it. And the javana stage, this is the most important from the ethical or karmic point of view, because it's in this stage that the wholesome and the unwholesome cheetahs originate. So it's in the javana stage that one creates karma. I would guess in the five sense door process, the karma would be very, very weak because one is not yet clearly aware of the object. So it would be probably in my later mind door processes that the more significant karmic forces are created. Okay, then if the object is especially clear, then at the end of the process, there will occur a type of chitta, which is called in Pali, tadaramana, which literally means taking that as object. And we translate this freely as registration. And so this chitta has the function of taking as its object the object that had been cognized by the, in the Javana phase. And I guess the function of this is sort of to, in a way to register the object, to make it available for recollection at, on subsequent occasions. And this function is performed just for two mind moments immediately after the Javana phase in a sense sphere process when the object is either very prominent at one of the five senses or particularly clear to the mind with, on the occasion of inward reflection. When the object is not very prominent or clear, then the registration cheetahs don't occur at all. Then after registration, then as we see, the stream, the flow of consciousness or the flow of cheetahs drops back into the stream of the bhavanga. Okay, then the last function, function 14, is the function of death. And this is the called the chuti cheetah, the death consciousness. And this is the last cheetah to occur in any individual existence. It's the chitta that marks the ending of a particular lifetime. And this chitta, in terms of its composition, is of the same type as the rebirth consciousness and the bhavanga, but it differs by way of function. And that is function is to pass away. And here I have to distinguish the death chitta from the last cognitive process occurring in a lifetime, the death proximate process. Because people think that it's what occurs at the very end of life, immediately before death, that has a major impact on one's rebirth. And that is generally true, but that is a active cognitive process, not the death consciousness itself. The death consciousness is just one momentary chitta, which sort of marks the end of the lifetime. And I compare the death consciousness <laughs> to when you see a movie, When the movie is over on the screen, at least in the old movies, then after the last scene of the movie, then just the words appear on the screen, 
the end. <laughs> and that means the movie is over. And so the death consciousness is somewhat like that frame that says the end. <laughs> it just means it's that one moment which is signing out of the life that's ended. But this is a resultant chitta. It's not a karmically productive chitta. Rather, it's the chittas that occur close to the time of death that will have an important impact on the mode of rebirth. But the death chitta is just like saying, lifetime over, move on to the next stage. Okay, so these are the 14 functions. And now, this is going to get a little complex and technical. Now the Abhidham, the Abhid, the manual of Abhidhamma is going to explain what types of chittas perform these functions. And I think it's easiest to get that from the explanatory notes. Yeah, so here I just have that note to the point I already explained that any type, any chitta or type of consciousness may perform several functions completely different from the one after which it's named. Okay, so now we come to the functions of rebirth, bhavanga, and death. And it's in any single life, it's the same type of consciousness that performs these three functions. So in my life, it's the same type of chitta that performed the function of rebirth, that's now performing the function of Bhavanga, and at death, you will perform the function of death. And in each one of you, for each one of you, you have your own particular type of chitta performing these three functions. And so it said that there are 19 chitas which perform these three functions. And to help refresh, let us try to find the table of chitas. Okay, so 19 chitas perform these three functions. But for each person, it will be a different one. It's not that on Wednesday, I could have one type of chitta performing my bhavanga function. On Thursday, a different chitta will take over that role. Friday, another cheat type of chitta comes in to take on the role of bhavanga. But throughout the whole course of life, it's the same type of chitta performing those functions. Okay, so now we have the first case that's taken is rebirth into the lower realms. So that's into the hells, the animal realm, the sphere of the ghosts, and the realm of the azuras, the titanic beings. And the chitta that performs the rebirth and bhavanga chitta rebirth, bhavanga, and death functions in these realms is the unwholesome resultant investigating consciousness. But and the, on those occasions, it is not performing the function of investigation. That's just the general name for that type of chitta. But on those occasions, that type of chitta is performing these functions of rebirth, bhavanga, and death for the beings in the lower realms of, of existence, the realms of misery. Okay, then in the case of a human rebirth, for human beings who are congenitally 
blind, deaf, and dumb, or who have some inherent sort of mental defect in the functioning of the mind, not a psychopathological condition, but in, like inability to understand things clearly, difficulty, like what they call like uh, learning defects and so on, as well as along among certain lower types of, of gods and spirits, it is the wholesome resultant investigating consciousness accompanied by equanimity. So a human rebirth is always the result of a wholesome karma, but this wholesome resultant investigating consciousness, it's a relatively weak rebirth consciousness because it is rootless. It doesn't have any roots, any of the beautiful roots. And so that particular disability itself will be the result of unwholesome karma, like being born blind, deaf, and so on. But the human rebirth itself is the result of wholesome karma. But in this case, it's a relatively weak wholesome karma. Okay, and then in the case of those reborn in the realm of the sense sphere gods and the sense sphere heavens, and as human beings free from congenital defects, it is the beautiful sense sphere resultants that perform the function of rebirth, bhavanga, and death consciousness. So if you remember, yeah, so it was these types of consciousness, the result sense sphere resultant consciousness that performed those functions of rebirth bhavanga and death for God, the gods and the sense sphere heavens and humans who were free from congenital defects. And these beautiful resultants might have two roots or three roots. That is, they'll have at least non-greed and non-hatred as their roots. But in the best case, they'll also have the root of non-delusion wisdom. And so our task from an Abhidhamma point of view, we should be striving to ensure that we get, if we're not going to get a rebirth in the higher realms, that we take rebirth back in the human realm with three roots, with the root of wisdom. And so to gain the root of wisdom, the way to do this is through systematically studying the Dharma, through practicing meditation, particularly insight meditation. So in this way, we will be in this life, strengthening the root of wisdom in an active role. And that will help to ensure that the wisdom carries through into the rebirth consciousness and the bhavanga. And when we have three roots in our bhavanga consciousness, that enables us to understand things more quickly, more thoroughly, more deeply, and then to reach the higher attainments in meditation. So these are 10 shittas that refer to rebirth in the sense, sense sphere plane of existence. Tending to highlight too much. <laughs> okay, then, for rebirth in the fine material plane of existence, we have the five fine material sphere resultants take on the, that function. Yeah, so we went through them yesterday. So those are the five resultant chitas corresponding to the five jhana attainments. 
And so with those rebirth types of rebirth consciousness, one will take rebirth One will take rebirth depending on one's type of rebirth consciousness. One will be reborn in the first jhana plane, the second, third jhana plane, the fourth jhana plane, or the fifth, or the fifth jhana plane. And so the five fine materials, fear, resultants, perform the function of rebirth, life continuum, and death for those reborn into the fine material plane of existence. And then the four immaterial sphere resultants will take on those three functions for those who are reborn into the immaterial planes of existence. For those who are reborn in the plane of infinite space, it will be the rebirth, it'll be the resultant chitta of the base of infinite space. That is their re rebirth Pavanga and death consciousness. And so for the sphere of infinite consciousness, nothingness, neither perception nor non-perception. Okay, so this covers the functions of rebirth, Pavanga and death consciousness for beings reborn in the lower planes, human birth for those who are congenitally blind, deaf, dumb, and so forth, um, for the humans and devas who are free from these disabilities, and for those reborn in the fine material sphere and immaterial sphere. Then we come to the function of inverting, turning to the object. And there are two chitas that perform the function of inverting. One is this five sense door inverting chitta, which turns to the one or another of the sense doors when an object comes at one of the sense doors, one of the physical sense doors. And then there's the mind door inverting chitta, which turns to the object when an object arises at the mind door. You know, the mind is always sort of churning up objects, sort of at a very subliminal level. But every once in a while, one of those objects will sort of catch the attention and we turn to it. And that will sort of trigger a sequence of reflective thoughts. And so it's the mind door adverting chitta that starts that process by turning to the object appearing at the mind door. And both of these are rootless functional chitas. Okay, then we have the five sense sensory functions, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching. And those functions can be performed by either of two chitas. That is, if it's an agreeable object that's appearing or be, yeah, agreeable object that's appearing will be the wholesome resultant eye consciousness that sees the form with a wholesome resultant ear consciousness that hears the sound and so on. If it's a disagreeable object, then it will be an unwholesome resultant eye consciousness or an unwholesome resultant ear consciousness and so on. And so we have five functions and two cheetahs able to perform each one of those functions. So sometimes this is called, this whole group is called the double fivefold sensory consciousness. Five types of sense consciousness, which can be either wholesome resultant or unwholesome resultant. Okay, then the function of receiving. Also, there are two types of receiving consciousness, unwholesome resultant and wholesome resultant. The investigating consciousness, the function of investigating, 
we have three cheetahs that perform this function, two are rootless resultants accompanied by neutral feeling. If it's agreeable object, it'll be a wholesome resultant. If it's a disagreeable object, a unwholesome resultant. But if it's an especially agreeable object, then the will be a wholesome resultant investigating consciousness accompanied by joy. Okay, then the function of determining. Now it said that there's no distinct chitta known as a determining consciousness, but rather it's the same type of chitta that in the mind door process performs the function of mind door adverting in a sense door process performs the function of determining the object. So it's one type of chitta which can perform two distinct functions. Okay, then we have the function of the javana. Remember, the javana is the most important phase. Well, I think you already will remember it. The javana is the most important phase because it's in that phase that the wholesome and the unwholesome shitas arise that create karma. And so it's said here that 55 shitas perform the function of javana. 55 types of cheetahs occur in the javana phase. So these are the 12 unwholesome cheetahs, 21 wholesome cheetahs. And then I have a note, it's rather small. Let me see if I can increase the size. Yeah, I don't know how to increase the size. Okay, anyway, the, I'll, I'll read off what they are. The 21 wholesome cheetahs. <laughs> so these are eight sense sphere wholesome cheetahs, five fine material sphere wholesome cheetahs. Those are the five... <clears throat> the cheetahs of the five jhanas, the four immaterial sphere wholesome cheetahs. Those are the cheetahs corresponding to the four immaterial sphere meditative absorptions. The four super mundane paths, the cheetahs of the path of stream entry, once returning, non-returning in our hasha. Okay, then there are, so that's 21. Then there are 18 functional cheetahs that occur in this role. These are the eight sense sphere functionals. Those are the ordinary cheetahs of an arhat when he goes about his everyday activities. So they're just you know, nothing special, just like brushing the teeth, going for a walk, resting in bed, whatever. So just sense sphere cheetahs, similar to those, to the wholesome cheetahs, but they don't create karma. And so that's called functional. Then the five fine material sphere functional. This is when the arhat enters into one or another of the five jhanas, the four immaterial sphere functional when the arhat enters into the immaterial sphere attainments, 
And then there is that rootless, smiling chitta. So 13, 17, so those are 18 functional chitas. And then this, oh, I almost skipped over this. This might be a little puzzling. You see, normally the resultants don't occur in the Javana phase, but there's one exception. And that is with the attainment of the four super mundane paths, the fruits occur in the Javana phase after the path attainment. And when a person, a noble person, a person who's achieved one of the stages of realization wants to enter into the fruition meditative attainment. That meditative attainment consists of resultant chitas flowing on in the javana phase. It sounds a bit perplexing and I don't know how to, you know, to explain that, but that's just what, what they say. Okay, and then the last we have here is the function of registration. And these, what performs the function of registration are resultant cheetahs. And there are 11 cheetahs that perform this function of registering the object. That is the eight sense sphere resultant cheetahs and the three investigating cheetahs. These cheetahs can arise in that position of registering the object. Again, it's not completely clear to me how a resultant cheetah performs the function of registration, but that's what they say. And then the next section, maybe we don't have to go into this, but this will take the different types of cheetahs and show, actually this could be done pretty quickly. This is getting too um, dense and technical. No Bante. No Bante. Okay, so this takes the cheetahs and shows which functions they perform. The previous section shows the functions and then describes which cheetahs perform those functions. So here we have the two types of investigating cheetahs accompanied by equanimity perform five functions. And you see only one of them is, is investigating. The others are the three functions of rebirth linking, bhavanga, death, and registration. So these two types of investigating chitta, they have the most functions and only one is investigation, the others don't have anything to do with investigation. But the chitta is named after this particular function. Okay, then we have the eight sense sphere resultants, the great sense sphere resultants with roots these perform four functions, the three of rebirth linking, life continuum and death and the function of registration. The nine sublime resultants, the sublime means fine material sphere and immaterial sphere. So we have nine, so that's five from the fine material sphere that is corresponding to the five jhanas and four from the immaterial sphere corresponding to the four immaterial attainments. So these nine cheetahs perform three functions, rebirth linking, bhavanga and death. Then the investigating cheetah accompanied by joy has two functions, investigating the object and registration, registering the object. Then the determining consciousness, 
or maybe I should more correctly call this the mind or adverting consciousness has two functions, determining the object at the five sense doors and adverting to the mental object at the mind door. And all the remaining cheetahs perform only one function as they arise, that is the javana, what's called the triple mind element. That's the five door adverting chitta and the two types of receiving chittas and the two types of fivefold sense consciousness. All of these have only one function. Yeah, the clarifying the javana here. The 55 chittas that perform the function of javana occur only in the role of javana and don't perform any other functions. And then we have all of this is illustrated in this table here, the table, the compendium of functions. So if you look up a particular cheetah, then you can see which functions it performs. So for example, I take eye consciousness. I want to find what is the function of eye consciousness. And I look down this row and I see only the function of seeing, no other function. But suppose I take the investigating cheetah accompanied by equanimity and I look down the row, then I see it has the three functions, rebirth, bhavanga, and death. And the function of investigating and the function of registration. So that has five functions. Okay, maybe we should take some questions now. Thank you, Bhante. I'll, I'll turn over to Richard. Okay. Got a number of questions. Yes, Bunty. So there are a couple of questions here. Um, <clears throat> could you clarify uh, the terms mind, cheetah, consciousness, thought? If thought is not the same as cheetah, then at what stage in the cognitive series do thoughts arise? Okay. Yeah, of course, these are English words. And, you know, Pali is a much more, in a sense, precise language with more technical usage. So in Pali, when I speak, in fact, in discussing the Abhidhamma, I prefer to use the Pali word chitta to refer to this individual occasion of knowing or of experiencing an object. And then what we translate as consciousness is vinyana. But also I should say that in the comprehensive manual, I was following an earlier translator who rendered chitta as consciousness. So in the comprehensive manual, when the word consciousness is used, it's usually referring to chitta, but in Pali, we have another word that's translated consciousness. This is vinyana. So when we speak about eye consciousness, we have chaku vinyana. The same for ear consciousness and so on, body consciousness, kaya vinyana. Mind consciousness, Mano Vinyana. So when discussing the, the way, let's say the mind arises at the six sense bases, then we speak about six types of Vinyana. And Vinyana is the word that normally I would translate as consciousness. And then we have the word mano, which 
in the Abhidhamma system, it's used in various ways. Sometimes it's used as a synonym for chitta or vijnana, but in other contexts, it's used to represent, let us say, the door, the organ through which vijnana or consciousness or mental activity arises. And in that case, mano is given the narrower meaning of referring to the bhavanga chitta as the doorway through which active types of ch active chittas arise. Then the word thought could represent something more specific, and that is represented in Pali by vitaka, or sometimes vitaka and vichara together, which are what sometimes are translated as applied thought and sustained thought. And these are more specific functions which accompany many chitas, most chitas. So most chitas involve thinking, involve thought, but there are chitas which don't involve thought, as we will see as we go further in today's uh, program. Okay, next question. Very good, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Um, the second one is, if cheetah is knowing, how can it have other functions? I don't think I ever said that cheetah is confined to the function of knowing. I just said that the general characteristic of a cheetah is taking an object, knowing an object, experiencing an object. But within that broad domain of experiencing an object, it necessarily has to have other functions. Like if the object is a visible form, then the cheetah will have the function of seeing the form. Um, If the cheetah, it's if the object has just arrived, the cheetah will have will be knowing the object, but it has a narrower function of investigating the object to deep and then determining what that object is. But all of those are different, more specific modalities, we could say, or dimensions of that broad category or broad function of knowing an object, experiencing an object. I mean, perhaps I could just reverse that question. So it, is it proper to understand cheetah a bit like, you know, a Swiss army knife with lots of functions? Yeah, that's a good, that good analogy, yeah. I see, so it's, it's not fully analyzed. What do you mean not fully analyzed? Well, because like a Swiss army knife has multiple blades, so it's got multiple things it can do. Yeah. So you could say Swiss Army knife, or you could say, no, I mean the scissors on a Swiss Army knife. Exactly. Actually, that's a very good analogy in that respect. Okay. We could refer to the whole thing. Actually, it's the other, but it's the other things in the Swiss Army knife correspond not so much to the other functions of cheetah, but rather to the chaitasikas, the mental factors that occur along with the cheetah. And that's what I'm going to be taking next, are the, ment the mental factors. Thank you, Bandy. Um, so those those would be the mental factors. Would be like the scissor, the nail clipper, the, the file, and so forth, and the Swiss Army knife. Well, no, but that's where it's a little confusing because you've got multiple functions here yeah. before you get to the chitasikas. Then you've got multiple functions in the chitasikas as well. Just so sort yeah. of Swiss Army knife squared. Yeah, yeah. Would that be correct? Okay. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah, yeah. The third question is, why does death happen? That obviously death is being described here, but what causes it? Why, why should there be a death cheetah? Why doesn't it just keep on going? Why does death happen? <laughs> yes, why, why, in the Abhidhamma, is there any explanation for why death happens? Actually, there is. It, it occurs in chapter five, 
I think they say that there are two primary causes for death. One is sort of the natural exhaustion of the lifespan or the exhaustion of the karma that brought about the existence. So that would be, you know, when a, we're born, there's a karma which sort of has a tendency to determine our lifespan. So whether it's 75 years, 80 years, 85 years. So that would be, and once that karma of the lifespan is exhausted, then one has to die. But then there can be some other karma can arise and cause a premature death so that that karma comes and cuts off the lifespan prematurely so that the life doesn't run through the full course that's naturally determined or originally determined by the karma generating the rebirth. So Bhante, just to be clear that it, it is that karma a cheetah or is there a separate scheme for karmas? No, karma is generated by cheetahs, but karma is not itself a cheetah. Karma is, I just, I guess you would just call it a force. Thank you, Bhante. Um, in order for a rebirth, does there have to be an accumulation of cheetahs of a particular type? Or is it just the death cheetah itself that determines the rebirth? It is, it isn't, in fact, the point that I was making earlier, or thought that I was making, is that it is not the death consciousness that determines the rebirth. The function of the death consciousness is just to sign off the life that is ending. What determines the mode of rebirth would be the active cognitive processes in the phase leading up to the death, but not the actual chitta with which the life ends. And then what occurs in the chittas or in the active process preceding the death is usually under normal circumstances, a kind of repetition of the habitual karma that we've created in the course of our life. But this gets into a big topic for which there's a whole, or at least a large section of a chapter in this manual of Abhidhamma in chapter five. Um, then how can the cheetahs of seeing, hearing, etc., be unwholesome or wholesome if there is no determining of the object at this point? Yeah, the cheetahs which perform the function of seeing and hearing, the eye consciousness and ear consciousness, these chitas are not themselves wholesome or unwholesome. They are resultant chitas, but they are resultants respectively of, in the case of a disagreeable object, the result of an unwholesome karma. In the case of an agreeable object, the result of a wholesome karma. So we give them the designation unwholesome resultant eye consciousness and wholesome resultant eye consciousness. It doesn't mean that the eye consciousness is unwholesome or wholesome, but rather the eye consciousness is the result of an unwholesome karma or the result of a wholesome karma. But nice. as a resultant, it's indeterminate, neither wholesome nor unwholesome. Thank you, Bhante. Um if you've never experienced the jhanas, do the supramundane jhanas occur in your life stream? I mean, all the jhanic, uh, just the cheetahs that, 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 that are involved with the jhanas, do they appear in your life stream or do they not even appear in your life stream? Yeah, this gets into a technical point that I didn't go into because it might be a little too complicated, but I'll just sort of, mention this briefly. Okay, when the person attains the world transcending path or fruit, path and fruit, those chitas occur at a level of concentration 
corresponding to one or another of the five jhanas. In the case of a meditator who attains, regularly attains the jhanas, the path and fruition experience will occur at the level of the jhana that they have previously mastered. Probably the, high, the highest level of jhana that they've previously mastered. So say we have a meditator who's mastered the third jhana, then develops insight, reaches the path and fruit, then their path and fruition experience will occur at a level of concentration corresponding to that of the third jhana. So that can be called a third jhana path and fruition experience. Okay, now we have the case of a meditator who doesn't develop the jhanas, but takes a different approach, which is called the approach of dry insight or bare insight. So without developing jhana, they go directly into the practice of insight. And then through developing insight, they reach the path and fruit. And so the question is, what is the level of the jhanic level of their path and fruit? Since they didn't develop jhana in the course of their life, but the path and fruit has to occur at a with a degree of concentration corresponding to a jhana. For that type of meditator, the path and fruit will be that of the lowest jhana. It'll be at the level of the first jhana. I think that does that answer the question. Well, there's one, obviously the other question is, what about a non-meditator? Who, who gains the- no jhanic experience at all, like most of us. What happens then? Who gains the path and fruit? Well, no, but just, in terms of the way the cheetahs are being organized, the jhanic cheetahs pay a big role. Yeah. These occur in non meditators, or are they not even active? Are they not oh. even active? No, I don't think the jhana cheetahs can occur in non meditators, except there might be a case of somebody who has maybe never meditated in this lifetime. Maybe their mind focuses on some object. And but, be, but if they've practiced jhanas in previous lifetimes, they might have that disposition. So if they focus, say they see a bright light and just momentarily they focus on it, maybe the mind goes into a jhanic state. But you could say that their focus on that bright light, even though it's just lasting 15 or 20 seconds, but we could say that it is a very concise meditative practice that leads them into the jhana. But that's extremely, extremely, extremely rare. Normally to go into a jhana, one has to strive and struggle diligently over a long period. And then finally, buddy, one last question. When there are two types of cheetah that perform the same function, yeah. as in the table, what determines which one of them does it? Let's see. Okay, so in the case of rebirth, linking life continuum and death, what determines which cheetah will take on that function? That depends on the karma that is going to de determine the rebirth process. Um, In the case of this investigating consciousness accompanied by joy, and maybe to deal with that question gets too complicated. There is a process though by which one- Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, thank you, Bhante. That's all the questions. Okay. So now we're coming to chapter two in the comprehensive manual. The section that I, just finished going through is actually in chapter three, but I just took one section from that chapter. And so this chapter is called the compendium of mental factors. And the Pali word that 
is used to represent the mental factors is the word chaitasika, which you can see is from the same root as the word chitta. And so the chaitasikas are mental factors that occur in immediate association with, with the chitta, and they assist the chitta by performing more specific tasks in the total act of cognition, of experiencing an object. Somebody asked before, how, how can, if a chitta has the function of knowing, how could it perform other functions? But actually there are many, many functions that are being performed by the chitta. And the reason the their ability to perform their functions or they are able to perform these functions because they arise with a kind of a multitude of chaitasikas, a kind of cluster of chaitasikas, mental factors that perform these more specific tasks within the total act of knowing or experiencing an object. So the two are interdependent, but the chitta is regarded as primary and it's said that the chaitasikas assist the chitta in knowing the object. And the relationship between the two is compared to that between a king and his retinue. And so when the king goes someplace, the king doesn't go alone, but he's always accompanied by his retinue of attendants. And so whenever a chitta occurs, it doesn't occur alone, but it's always accompanied by this group of mental factors, the chaitasikas. And the defining, uh, the description or definition of the mental factors, the chaitasikas, are, fa are factors, phenomena, that they have four um, characteristics. They arise together with the chitta. So it's ekupada, one arising. They seize together with the chitta. When the chitta seizes, it's chaitasika seize along with them. They have the same object. So if the chitta has a visible form as its object, all of the chaitasikas take that form as the object. And so with sound, odor, and so on. And they have the same base as the chitta. That is the physical base on which the chitta arises. The chaitasikas share that base. So if the chitta arises at the eye, the chaitasikas occur at the eye. If the chitta arises at the ear, Chaitasikas arise at the ear. So with this physical base, they arise with the common support of either one of the material sense organs or the heart base. Within the Abhidhamma commentarial system, there's something called the heart base, a kind of material form in the region of the heart that's considered the material basis for certain states of mind, for certain shittas. Okay, now, within the Theravada Abhidhamma, but the Theravada Abhidhamma enumerates 52 chaitasikas, which are distinguished into different classes. And out of curiosity, I looked, um, a little earlier today, before the class, I looked at the Savast. I have a book on the Savastivada Abhidharma. And the Savastivada Abhidharma has also a list of, they call them chaitas or chaitasikas, which are partly similar to the Theravadan version, but also different in some respects. So I don't think we can regard that this list of mental factors in the Theravada Abhidharma is absolutely authoritative 
but you could see that different Buddhist schools had different interpretations of which mental states should be classified as chaitasikas and different interpretations of exactly where they fit into the overall picture. But here we'll be de dealing with the Theravada version of the chaitasikas. So the total that we have listed is 52. And these are grouped into, I think we could say three major groupings. One are the ethically variable factors. The second will be the unwholesome factors. And the third will be the beautiful mental factors. So the first of the ethically variable factors, which means that these factors can occur in wholesome cheetahs, in unwholesome cheetahs, in indeterminate cheetahs. So they don't have a fixed ethical quality, but they take on the ethical quality of the cheetah in which, to which they belong. And the ethically variable factors are subdivided into two groups those which are called universals, which occur in every chitta whatsoever. And then there are the variables. I think we've called them, well, here they call the occasionals. Those that might occur in some chittas, don't, but don't necessarily occur. Yeah, I think to explain them, it's best to do it from the, from the explanatory notes. Okay, so we have the 52 mental factors, the ethically variable factors, in which there are seven universals and six occasionals. So these are united under the designation Anya Samana, which literally it means the same as the other but freely I render it ethically variable. And these are so-called because they take on the ethical quality of the cheetah itself. And the ethical quality of the cheetah is determined by the roots of the cheetah. So in wholesome cheetahs, these factors become wholesome. In unwholesome cheetahs, they become unwholesome. In the comically indeterminate cheetahs, they become indeterminate. Okay, then we have seven of these ethically variable factors are universals. They are state chaitasikas, mental factors common to all cheetahs present in every cheetah without exception. And these universals perform the most basic and essential cognitive functions. Without them, there could be no consciousness or experiencing of an object. So the first of these is called pasa, and which is translated as contact. And this, the way I explain it, is the mental factor by which consciousness or by which the cheetah mentally touches the object that has appeared, thereby initiating that particular cognitive event. And in the suttas, the pasa is explained as the coming together of consciousness, sense faculty and object. And so the way I interpret contact myself, I say that it is like we consider the sense faculty to be a door and the chitta to be inside on one side of the door, the object to be on the other side of the door. And so contact is like opening the door so that the cheetah can go out and shake hands with the object, or so that the object can come in through the door and shake hands with the cheetah. So contact is a function 
or it's a factor of the chitta, but it's that factor by which the chitta mentally touches the object. It seems a little bit odd to consider that as a separate mental factor rather than just an event, but that's the way it's done in the Abhidhamma. Okay, the second universal mental factor is feeling. So feeling here doesn't mean emotion, which is a rather complex phenomenon, but rather feeling is the, I call it the particular tone, the felt tone of an experience, either pleasant, painful, or neutral. And so that particular tone of the experience, that is Vedana. So it's the affective quality, affective quality of an experience, either pleasant, painful, or neutral. The third universal is sanya, translated here as perception. And this has the function of, say, homing in on the qualities of the object. And it's said in the commentaries, this function is to make a sign as a condition for perceiving on a later occasion that this is the same thing, or its function is recognizing what has been previously perceived. And so we might see the function of perceiving perception most clearly at a gross level. If you meet a person for the first time, when you meet that person, you're introduced, you look at the person's face, and then you take in the features of that face. So that would be the specific taking in of the features would be the activity of sanya, of perception. Then on a later occasion, if you come into a room and you look up and you see that person, you recognize the face because previously when you first met them, you perceive their face and even without specific intention, but you just noted the features of the face. So now on the later occasion, you can recognize it. So that is perception. And perception, it's, I mean, it goes on throughout the day countless times, but only on some occasions does it really become very clear and distinct. Okay, the next universal mental factor is, in Pali, is called Chaitanya, which I translate as volition. And so this signifies what we call the volitional aspect of cognition. And so it's said that every chitta involves some degree of volition, some intention regarding the object. And volition is said to be the most significant mental factor in relation to karma, since it's volition that generates karma and it's volition that determines the ethical quality of the action. But maybe I would say that it's volition in association with the roots, the wholesome or unwholesome roots that determine the ethical quality of the action. It's a bit puzzling to me, and I don't know the answer to this, that the resultant chittas are the results of past karma, and yet they too are said to have volition, but they're not creating karma. So that, to me, is a bit of a perplexing problem, and I don't have an easy solution to it. But maybe the answer lies in the way the commentaries explain that Chaitanya has the function of organizing the other mental factors in acting upon the object. So this is volition 
which again, we can call this the volitional or the intentional aspect of any chitta. Then the fifth universal feature is one point in this, the unification of the mind on its object. So this comes to prominence in developing samadhi and in attaining the jhanas, but it's said that in every chitta, there is a factor by reason of which the chitta is focused on the object. And that focusing on the object is the work of this factor, a kagita, one point in this. The sixth universal mental factor is called the mental life faculty. So there's a physical life faculty which keeps the body alive, but it's said that the, even the cheetahs themselves have some mental factor that vitalizes them, that makes them occur. And that is the mental life, facu <coughs> life faculty. And then the seventh ment universal mental factor is attention. And attention is said to be the mental factor responsible for the mind's advertence to the object, turning to the object, the factor by reason of which the object is made present to the chitta. And so the commentary say is characteristic is conducting or leading the associated mental states including the cheetah, towards the object. And attention is compared to or illustrated by the rudder of a ship, which directs the ship to its destination, or like the charioteer of a chariot who sends the horses towards their, their destination. Okay, so these are the seven universal mental factors. And these, as I said, are called universal because they're present in every chitta, indispensable for the operation of the chitta. Then we come to six factors, which are called occasionals or miscellaneous factors, factors which may be present in certain cheetahs, they're necessarily present, but in other cheetahs, they don't occur. So we could go through these. And these, again, they're ethically variable factors, taking on the ethical quality of the cheetah in which they occur. Okay, so the first of these is Vitaka which is here translated initial application. And often vitaka can also be translated as thought or thinking. So sometimes I translate it as applied thought. So it's defined as the applying of the mind to the object or directing of the mind onto the object. And in this respect, vitaka seems somewhat similar to attention, which we just which we just examined. But here I have a note saying that attention should be distinguished from vitaka, from thought, in that attention turns the concomitants that is, the, it turns the, other, the mind and the other mental factors towards the object, whereas vitaka applies the mind to the object, sort of directs the mind onto the object. If the distinction is not very clear to you, it's also not very clear to me. <laughs> but this is what is said in the text. And then Vitaka comes to play an important role in developing the jhanas, Vitaka together with Vichara, because 
in order to keep the mind focused on an object with the aim of detaining the jhana, what one has to do is repeatedly bring the mind back again and again to the object. And so that act of bringing the mind back to the object and applying the mind to the object is the work of vitaka. So the way I would see this in the case of say, doing mindfulness of breathing where the task is to keep the mind on the breath as it moves in and out. Naturally, the mind tends to move away and to roam and wander then you recognize the mind is wanted and then you bring the mind back to the breath and it's sort of like you're applying the mind to the breath. You could say that that applying of the mind back to the breath, that is the work of Vitaka. And then the counterpart, the sort of twin brother of Vitaka is vichara, translated here as sustained application. And this is uh, described as the continued pressure on the object or the sustained application of the chitta and the other mental factors to the object. And it can be seen in the anchoring of these phenomena on the object. Some of these other factors, okay, we can go through. So one factor, the next factor, third variable factor is the Pali word is adimoka, which is translated here as decision. And the word adimoka, it literally signifies the releasing of the mind onto the object. And so if for that reason, I render it decision or resolution is said to have the characteristic of conviction and it's manifested as decisiveness. Then we have energy, which in a way is almost intuitive, self-explanatory, some kind of vigor or burst of energy within the mind. The fifth variable uh, occasional factor is PT. Here translated zest, which again, I'm not happy with this, but I would prefer to render it as elation or delight. So it's a mental factor that we said to refresh the body and mind, and it gives the thrill of delight, thrill of rapture, and it appears as elation. And the sixth variable, occasional factor is desire. And the Pali word here is chanda. And this means the desire to act, to do something, the desire to perform an action or to achieve some result. It's not desire in the reprehensible sense of craving, greed, or lust, or attachment. But we naturally, we have desires to do anything, desire to get some exercise, desire to speak, desire to, many, many desires. So all of those desires to act are driven by this mental factor of chanda. And so, well, craving, greed, lust, those are always unwholesome fet factors. So chanda is an ethically variable factor, simply the desire to act to achieve a particular result. Okay, maybe I'll go through the unwholesome factors and then we could take some questions. So now we have 14 unwholesome factors. First, they're listed here, but I'll take them with the explanatory notes. And first I should explain that the unwholesome factors 
fall into four into two sets. There are universal unwholesome factors. And then variable unwholesome factors. So we have four unwholesome factors that are universal. They're present in all unwholesome shittas. So these are delusion, shamelessness, fearlessness of wrongdoing and restlessness. So let's take them one by one. So delusion is the same as ignorance and it's explained as kind of mental blindness, non-penetration, not understanding the real nature of things, the absence of right understanding or kind of mental darkness. Okay, so the next two always go together as a pair. I think the meanings of these two come out more clearly when we do the opposites, the, the beautiful opposites. Okay, so one of them is shamelessness and the other is fearlessness of, with regard to wrongdoing. So shamelessness means the absence of disgust or let's say the absence of revulsion against bodily and verbal misconduct and anotapa fearlessness of wrongdoing is the absence of dread on account of such misconduct the distinction between them is that maybe I should pass over these two for now and go back to them later after we do the positive counterparts, shame and fear of wrongdoing. That makes the sense clearer. So we'll just go on to the fourth universal unwholesome state. This is restlessness, which is said to have the characteristic of disquietude or some degree of agitation. And this is present in every unwholesome chitta. So every unwholesome chitta has, it's covered over by delusion, which allows the unwholesomeness to take place by a lack of shame and dread regarding wrongdoing. And there's always some degree of inner turmoil or agitation in the unwholesome chitas. Okay, now we come to those unwholesome mental factors that are present in some chitas, but not in others. So the first of these is loba or greed. So this is, as we've saw yesterday, this is the first unwholesome root, and it covers all degrees of selfish desire so the word greed suggests a strong, powerful desire, selfish desire. But loba can range from a very light clinging, a very subtle attachment to a deep longing and to unquenchable selfish desire. Okay, then comes wrong view which means seeing things wrongly, interpreting things wrongly, believing things in having wrong belief. And among the different wrong views enumerated in the Buddha's teachings, there are certain types of wrong views which are seen to be detrimental to the very foundations of ethics, of moral conduct. For example, the view that it doesn't matter what we do, we can do anything we want and don't have to face the consequences. 
or the view that there's no validity to the distinction between good and bad, that those are just subjective judgments of the mind, or the wrong view that after death, there's no continuation of personal existence beyond death, that death marks the complete end of personal existence. So those are some fundamental wrong views. And then there are subtler wrong views, particularly the views that affirm the reality of some kind of permanent self within the person behind our experience, that there is some stable, lasting entity that we can identify. This is what I am. This is the self, myself. So these are wrong views. Okay, then there is conceit. And the most fundamental conceit, according to the Buddha's teaching, is the conceit, I am, which is a bit different from the wrong view of self. The wrong view of self is a conceptually formulated view that I have a self, there is a self. The conceit I am doesn't take on that conceptual form of affirming the existence of a self, but it's just a kind of intrinsic, deep sense that I am, that there is some kind of I behind or within my experience. And then from that inherent sense of I am, then we compare ourselves to others and we rank ourselves as being either superior to others, being inferior to others, or being just as good as others. So those are considered three aspects of conceit. The superiority conceit, which in English is what we usually mean by conceit. Like here it said haughtiness or self-exaltation, but also self-debasement is a type of conceit and also putting oneself on, at the same level. I am as good as they are is also a type of conceit. So we have conceit. And what is interesting is that within the Abhidhamma system, wrong view and conceit are said to go along with greed. Like whenever wrong view arises in a chitta, it arises only in the chitta associated with greed. And also whenever conceit arises, it also arises only in chittas associated with greed. Okay, next we come to the second unwholesome root, which is Pali dosa or hatred. And even the word, the English word hatred suggests a very strong antagonism. But in Pali, the way it's explained, dosa comprises all degrees of aversion, ranging from strong ill will and resentment to very subtle types of annoyance or irritation. So greed is what sort of sticks to the object and tries to acquire, to grasp, and to hold on to the object. Whereas hatred is what turns away from the object, which, which is repelled by the object, or which tries to destroy the object. Okay, then the next mental factor, unwholesome factor, is envy. So envy is being envious of the success or good qualities of others. Dissatisfaction with the success and good qualities of others. The next unwholesome factor, I don't think avarice is such a good rendering because avarice suggests something like greed. So my preference here would be miserliness or stinginess.
And so that is the quality of not being willing to share one's own assets with others, whether it's not being willing to share one's material possessions with others, not being willing to, um, to share, for instance, to share the Dhamma with others. And so it can be recognized as a kind of meanness or sour feeling. Okay, the next factor, again, I don't think worry is such a good translation. I think worry is closer to restlessness. It seems to go along with restlessness better. So I would render this now as regret. So the way it's explained as it's explained as worry or remorse after having done wrong is characteristic as subsequent regret. Now, if you do wrong, of course, it's good to have some remorse about doing wrong and to try to make amends for one's misconduct. For example, if you commit, if you injure another person in some way, then you would apologize and try to heal the division and you would feel some kind of remorse for one's conduct. That would be considered, in my opinion, like a good quality. But this is the nagging remorse that goes on, with like a, a persisting sense of guilt that you've done something wrong and it won't allow you to feel comfort and calmness in the mind because of your transgression or your failure to do what was appropriate under certain conditions. So this is regret. Then we come to two qualities, two unwholesome qualities that usually are joined together, sloth and torpor, where now I render them dullness and drowsiness. So Tina is sluggishness or dullness of mind. Um, and maybe it can be seen in the sinking quality of the mind. And the counterpart, mida or torpor, which is, can be understood as drowsiness, is manifested as drooping, nodding, and sleepiness, but not the normal sleepiness when nighttime comes, when your normal sleeping time comes. I think the, these two qualities come to be included because of the experience of meditators who when you're meditating, like it might be, you might've had a good night's sleep and it's the middle of the morning and you sit to do the meditation. And then there comes a kind of dullness and heaviness of the mind. That is Tina. It's sort of like when the weather changes, you have a bright sunny day and then the sky changes and becomes this dull kind of gray. And so that if you can imagine that as a state of mind, that would be like Tina, sloth, dullness, sinking of the mind. And then you start to get drowsy. So you're sitting, maybe trying to observe in breath, out breath, in breath, out breath. In breath. <laughs> yeah, so that is Mita, drowsiness. And then the, the 14th, the last unwholesome mental factor is doubt. And this is not the doubt where you have questions about the Dhamma and then you want to ask these questions to investigate, to clear up the doubt. But this is a kind of skeptical doubt which prevents you from putting trust in the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, and the training. That inability to entrust oneself to the teacher and the teaching 
kind of wavering uncertainty, indecisiveness, which leads people, a lot of people who start off enthusiastic about the Dhamma, but then doubts start to arise and then they waver and then turn away. Okay, maybe we have, well, not much time for questions. Maybe if there's two questions or so, we could take them before the break. Yes, Bhante. Um, there are quite a few questions, and forgive me, there. Yeah, there I could imagine. Yeah. Last time, and I didn't get to them all. Um, let, let's just take three. Could we take three on the death process just to get these done? They're all okay, related. but I, you could ask the questions. I didn't really intend to go into details of the death process, but just see. Okay. Ask. How how long will the consciousness remain with the body after death before it takes rebirth? Yeah, that's a big question. And I thought we could just take questions that could be answered very quickly. But save that, <laughs> sa save that, save that question for the later, for the, the next session. Okay. Um, why is fear not added to an unwholesome category? Is fear not a chitaski in its own? I think I, I dealt with that question you yesterday. You did. Yeah, you did. Forgive me. Um, yeah. Then there's another one here. Um, can you explain how Vitaka is a specialized factor? which is not indispensable to thought. How can one have a thought without applying the mind to its object? I think we're going to see that. <laughs> we're going to see that or in the, in the next section, the next session, we'll see those cheetahs which don't have Vitaka and Vichara. Okay. But just to answer it quickly, okay, when one goes from the first jhana to the second jhana, Vitaka and Vit this is in the sutta system before jhanas, Vitaka and Vichara fall away. So the mind is absorbed in the object, but one is no longer directing or applying the mind on the object. Okay. Um, there's one here, short one. Is registration cheetah the same as memory? I wouldn't say that it's the same as memory, but it seems to me that the registration cheetah is what sort of imprints the experience within the mental stream so that the experience will become accessible to memory on a later occasion. That would be my understanding. Okay, Bhante. Can, you, can we take one more or is that? Okay, no? okay. One more. Okay, what is the Manavijana? Any association with rebirth link, Chita? Okay, the mano vijnana includes all chetas apart from the five-fold sensory consciousness. So the mano vijnana includes all types of set of consciousness except the five-fold sensory consciousness. So the rebirth consciousness itself is a kind of mano vijnana, but the mano vijnana has many, many manifestations. So even when I'm thinking while I'm talking and you're grasping my meaning with your minds while I'm talking, all of that <coughs> formulating of the ideas and understanding the ideas is the work of the mano vijnana. So doing everything except for the cognizing of the five types of sensory objects is the work of mano vijnana. Thank you, Bhante. Uh, do you wanna take, can we take one more? Okay, that... okay, I see there's still one minute left. Okay. Okay, uh, what is what is bare consciousness? Is there any term related to bare consciousness in the Theravada Abhidhamma? Yeah, I don't know anything that corresponds to that. Okay. Uh, certainly, it, there's no such thing as a consciousness without a cluster of mental factors going along with it. Sometimes I would say that chitta, to distinguish it from the chaitasikas, that if you want to distinguish, I would sometimes say that shita is the basic knowing or awareness of the object, and the chaitasikas perform the more specific functions within that act of knowing. But it's not that there's a knowing without any other mental functions taking place. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you, Bhante. I think we've come to the five o'clock for you.
or three o'clock for you, forgive me. Yeah. Okay. So then we come back at three o'clock. Then we'll go through the beautiful factors and then some more sections of this uh, of this chapter.